Former Beatle John Lennon, who was 40, was shot and killed last night outside his luxury apartment in New York. The alleged killer is an unemployed security guard and printer who had lived in Hawaii. Very, very sorry that this had to happen. December 8, 1980 was one of the darkest nights of my life. News of Lennon's death touched off a wave of shock and mourning around the world. It was just full court press in this story. He knew something subconsciously that he was looking into the eyes of the person that was going to kill him. Nothing special about the seal. Pretty, pretty strange character. They brought out Lennon. He was, he was limp. It takes a deranged person to single out one of the most well-known people in the world. First thing he said was, I acted alone and I was uh, ready for this to happen. I even heard a voice, my own, inside of me say, do it, do it, do it. God sent my husband, Mark, to me in March of 1978. Love. I was a travel agent at the time. I was the international expert. And Mark came to us for help in planning a vacation to the Far East, which quickly changed to a trip around the world. Mark David Chapman's troubled childhood unfolded in Georgia. In his teen years, he experimented with drugs and showed the first signs of mental illness. He would hear voices. Through my life, off and on, I have struggled with different things, as we all do. Dropping out of college, Chapman came to Oahu, depressed and suicidal. He was admitted to Castle Memorial Hospital for treatment. Once being released, he started working at the facility. He had gotten so well as a patient that he got a job there as a housekeeper. The Mark Chapman that I knew here at uh, Castle was uh, a Mark that uh, had a lot of enthusiasm for his, his work. He seemed to express an awful lot of happiness when he came in in the mornings. He, he did his job well, faithfully, sometimes even uh, beyond what we asked him to do. He'd come up with even more creative suggestions than maybe what we had given to him. He just was a, just a good guy. During the planning of that trip, I got to know Mark pretty well. We came in often to make changes or ask me things. And I found him to be kind, generous, sweet, thoughtful, and very smart. Just before he left, he sent me this big teddy bear on this tray that came with a dozen red roses. In the morning that he left, I just had this compulsion. I mean, I would never had done anything like this in my life, but I felt compelled to go to his house, although I didn't really know where it was, so I just kind of knew the general area, and I just felt compelled to go there and give him a lay. And I remember making this left turn, and he, just at that moment, putting his luggage into the trunk of a car. I mean, the timing was just perfect. And I gave Mark a kiss on the cheek as I put the lay around his neck. Well, I knew what hotels he was going to be staying at along the way since I had planned his trip and made the reservations. So I was able to surprise Mark by having letters waiting for him at a few hotels. And they were not love letters, just friendly ones. He reciprocated by sending me postcards as he traveled. I think my love for Mark began and grew with each arriving postcard. When he arrived back in Hawaii, I was there to meet him at the airport, and we began dating the very next night. By the end of that year, 1978, we felt as if we had known each other for years. There was only one problem. I was not a Christian, and I knew it was important to Mark that he become one. a new 
creation in Christ. Hallelujah. After Mark helped Gloria find her faith, the couple married in June of 1979, but their happiness was short-lived. Not long after our wedding, things started to change in our relationship. First, he lost his new job after a run-in with a nursing supervisor. He would get angry with me more easily, and on a couple of occasions, he hurt me physically. He started drinking alcohol and came home drunk a few times. We still had good times together, but he preferred not to join me and my friends when we had a party. He began to withdraw into himself. Chapman developed several obsessions, including with John Lennon and the book The Catcher in the Rye. A longtime Beatles fan, he now perceived Lennon as a phony, a theme of J.D. Salinger's novel that now consumed his thoughts. He grew angrier following Lennon's highly publicized comment that the Beatles were more popular than Jesus. Mark, why are you blaming a book? I'm not blaming a book. I blame myself for crawling inside of the book. It's my fault. I, I crawled in, found my uh, pseudo self within these pages, but that's fiction and uh, reality was standing in front of the Dakota. In October of 1980, Chapman quit his job as a Waikiki security guard and purchased a gun. He then went to New York with intentions to kill Lennon, but backed out and returned to Hawaii. He came home from that one scared. He told me he had planned to kill John Lennon, but he said my love had saved him. And he even had me hold the gun, which was still cold from being in the plane's cargo hold. Very cold. The only reason I was okay with him making another trip to New York was because he had convinced me when he said he realized he needed to grow up as an adult, and as a husband, maybe as a father someday. He needed time to think about his life. He wanted me to sacrifice a short time of being alone so that we could have a long, happy marriage together. Brooke Hart was Gloria's attorney. I could not identify any way she could have prevented it. The power difference in the relationship with her husband was such that, you know, he did what he wanted to do. To do. And if he wanted to go off to New York, Gloria, I'll see you later, I'm going to New York. Or to that extent. And she certainly had no inkling that he was going to do something, let alone kill one of the world's most well-known musicians. December 8, 1980 was one of the darkest nights of my life. I had come home by bus from work, fixed dinner, and plopped on the sofa and was watching Little House on the Prairie when suddenly words ran across the bottom of the screen like a ticker tape. John Lennon had, has been shot in New York City. I just knew it was Mark. This is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. Good evening. The death of a man who sang and played the guitar overshadows the news from Poland, Iran, and Washington tonight. Former Beatle John Lennon, who was 40, was shot and killed outside his luxury apartment in New York. The alleged killer is an unemployed security guard and printer who had lived in Hawaii. News of Lennon's death touched off a wave of shock and mourning around the world. And within two minutes of time I got there, they brought out Lennon. He was, he was limp. Um, he had blood coming outside of his mouth. Uh, he had his glasses on, and there were maybe five or six um, uh, police officers holding him, uh, carrying him, putting him in the back seat of a car. And very quickly, Yoko was with him. Lennon had been shot four times. He was taken to a nearby hospital where he was pronounced dead. Chapman remained at the scene until he was picked up by police. They brought from this kind of inside area, inside the gate. Um, uh, they were scuffling with the guy and brought him out and he was handcuffed behind his back. That apparently was the man that, that, that shot him. The Dakota's doorman yelled, do you know what you just did? And Chapman responded calmly, his face covered with Lennon's blood. I just shot John Lennon. Imagine all the people 
We learned um, fairly quickly that the um, killer was a man from Hawaii, and uh, it was a big story. I was a brand new reporter. In the newsrooms, it was just full court press on this story. Newsroom 9 at 6. Mark Chapman worked here at 444 Nahua Street in Waikiki as a security guard and maintenance man from December 21st, 1979 until last October 23rd. Well, he was very quiet most of the time, and he was a very good worker. We never had any problems with him. But Chapman did something very strange, and they say out of character for him, on October 23rd, the day he suddenly quit his job. He signed out on the employee's log as John Lennon. And we didn't know that. We just overlooked that until today, this morning. It was discovered. He normally signed Chap for Chapman. Right. That day he signed the name John Lennon, and then it is crossed out. Is that his cross out? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you don't know why? No. Not only had Chapman signed his final log sheet as John Lennon, but led his replacement to think his name really was John Lennon. You know what he did? The day that he left, because that's the day that I was hired. Yeah, right. On his name tag, he had John Lennon. Oh, you're kidding. I never noticed he that. He wrote it on a piece of paper and then taped it over his name tag. Most who knew Mark Chapman thought highly of him. The job counselor at the employment agency who sent him to the Waikiki condominium for whom Chapman painted this watercolor rainbow. But across the street at the Church of Scientology, they knew a different Mark Chapman. All of a sudden this guy, Chapman, just jumps in on me and starts screaming at me about this place being a cult and something really peculiar and attacking me and swearing at me. And I couldn't believe it. We both, the guy and I looked at each other and kind of looked over at Chapman and I, I thought, well, let me see if I can, you know, just talk to the guy sanely. What was his I, physical demeanor when, when he started verbally attacking? He was kind of jumping around and I dodging reckon. his head. Oh, yeah. Crazy. He would stand out in front of the apartment building now. The women that lived in the apartment building, he seemed to know every single one of them by their first names and, and would greet them very cordially. Then other girls walking by on the street uh, would get obscenities, uh, hey baby type uh, remarks. Uh, pretty, pretty strange character and he, he spent a lot of time pacing very nervously. He, he, when he go out in front of the building, he'd be pacing out there. There's this incredible covert hostility about it. I was at home late, and I got a phone call uh, in the middle of the night from a, a person, it was a man's voice, came on and said, um, Mark David Chapman has visited two mental health clinics in Hawaii before going to New York to kill John Lennon. And I said, uh, really? I mean, I, literally, I'm, I'm a reporter, been six months, and someone is giving me a tip on a huge national story. The person who called me wasn't the person who had the information. Because when I said, well, can you tell me where he went? The person goes, can I tell him where? And so the person was so concerned about being identified, he didn't even want to talk on the phone with me. Uh, the next day, I came in and uh, they wanted me to cover the legislature instead of covering that story. So I gave the tip to another reporter. Both clinics admitted that they had basically turned him away. You know, they, 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 the other big thing was just, you know, the huge national attention that was suddenly shifted on Hawaii. And I, the fact that he had gone and sought mental health treatment, you know, here and, and, and been turned away was kind of a black eye. Although you never know whether you know, something like that would have really prevented anything. He said he can't even remember vaguely. We sell quite a few guns, so it's not, uh, it's not as though it's, it's something, a rare event, you know. There's nothing special about the sale and nothing odd, you know, just a normal gun sale. A sale that apparently provided a murder weapon. There's nothing I can do about it. It was a strictly legitimate gun sale. Guy looked like a normal, uh, upright human being when he bought it. Nobody knows he's a schizo. And six weeks ago, he buys it and goes out and does something like this. Six weeks later, what the hell can you do, you know? Have you received threats for having sold the gun to yeah. Mr. Chapman? Yeah. 
but we're not really that concerned about them. Why not? Well, just look around you. Would you be concerned if he was here? The manager of Kukui Plaza, where Chapman has been living with his wife, says threats have not been received there, but extra security is on hand just in case. A guard was posted this afternoon at the Chapman's 21st floor apartment. Chapman's wife, the former Gloria Abe, is reported to be inside with a woman friend, declining to speak with reporters. We approached the door at about 7 this morning, before the guard was posted, and heard crying. Now, alone in our apartment, I was, I just paced around, and all I could say over and over was, oh, my God, oh, my God. I'm so thankful that I knew God at that terrifying moment so that I could call out to him to comfort me. My life changed, changed dramatically that night, as you can imagine. I was now Mrs. Mark David Chapman, the wife of a murderer, and not just any murderer, but one whose victim was known and loved by millions around the world. I just want to say that I'm just still, again, very concerned about Mark, and I'm just very, very sorry that this had to happen to uh, Yoko Ono and, and her family and that her husband had to die. I called one of my friends at one of the stations and made room for the literally hundreds of representatives of the media who wanted to question Gloria. I don't feel bitter. I don't think that's the right word. I'm not bitter about it. Um, I, I think that maybe just somehow some good was, is going to come out of this, this all. I don't, I don't know what, but I'm just hoping and praying that some good will come out of it. I'm just a very optimistic type person. I feel I've always been a forgiving person and that I cannot recall that I've not forgiven Mark for any, any wrong thing that he has done. I love him very much and I'm just very sorry that all this had to happen, that John Lennon had to die and that his wife and son are going through what they're going through. But we didn't know what, what the situation was going to, to be, but that, that event seemed to solve, for the most part, Gloria's concerns about the media and the degree of intrusion and the number of, of uh, persons who wanted to question her from the media uh, got pretty much less bothersome for her. I was standing there with a gun in my pocket. Knew you were going to shoot him? So, sorry? Knew you were going to shoot him? Absolutely. Okay. Tried not to, praying not to, but knowing down deep it was probably going to come to that. On the morning of the killing, Chapman purchased a copy of The Catcher in the Rye. In it, he wrote, this is my statement, and signed Holden Caulfield. He was distracted by reading it as he stalked Lennon outside the Dakota and missed his first chance of seeing him. John came back out. I don't remember him going back in from the taxi, but he was obviously back in the building. He was doing a, an RKO radio special. And I said, John, would you sign my album? And he said, sure. Chapman is referencing the double fantasy album he had Lennon sign as John and Yoko headed to a recording studio. A photographer was there and took a photo of what would be one of Lennon's last autographs. That image was soon plastered on newsstands around the world. At around 10.50 that night, the couple returned to the apartment building. Mark, will you relive with us those uh, terrible moments for you, for the world, for a lot of people uh, around and in circles close to John Lennon. What happened that night? He walked past me. I took five steps toward the street, turned, withdrew my Charter Arms 38, and fired. What happened before the shooting, before I pulled the trigger and after, were two different uh, scenes in my mind. Before, everything was like dead calm and I was uh, ready for this to happen. I even heard a voice, my own, inside of me say, do it, do it, do it, you know, here we go. And then afterwards, it was like the film strip broke. I fell in upon myself, 
I, I like went into a state of shock. I stood there with the gun hanging limply down on my right side and Jose the doorman came over and he's crying and he's grabbing my arm and he's shaking my arm and he shook the gun right out of my hand, which is a very brave thing to do. I, I just couldn't wait, Larry, until those police got there. I was just devastated. New York City police officer Steve Spiro arrived at the scene within minutes and arrested Chapman. The first thing he said was, I acted alone. I thought that was very strange. And then he said, don't hurt me and don't let anybody else hurt me. And I said, no, nobody's going to hurt you. You're with me. He was going like this, like with heartburn. I said, what's the matter? So I have a little heartburn. I said, do you want some Rolaids or something like that? He said, you would do that for me? And I said, yeah. For some reason, he trusted me because I guess I didn't beat him up or something. For decades, Spiro held on to letters that Chapman had written to him from prison. One of the first things he asked in the letter that he wrote to me was, do you know where my copy of the Catcher of the Rye is? And I wrote back, sure, it's in the district attorney's office. It was vouched, and it's evidence. You wrote back to him? Yeah. Why? Why? I think um, because I wanted to have him admit certain things that never got to trial. In this letter dated March 10th, 1983, one of four letters Chapman wrote to Spiro, Chapman writes, Lennon was a phony of the highest degree, but there were others who could and would have served the same purpose. He said that these people on the hit list, including John Lennon, were phonies. They were not taking their money and giving it to the charities that he thought they should be giving to. Mark David Chapman at that point was a walking shell who didn't ever learn how to let out his feelings of anger, of rage, of disappointment. Mark David Chapman was a failure in his own mind. He wanted to become somebody important, Larry. He didn't know how to handle being a nobody. He tried to be uh, a somebody through his years, but as he progressively got worse, and I believe I was schizophrenic at the time, no one can tell me I wasn't, mm. although I was responsible. Mark David Chapman struck out at something he perceived to be phony, something he was angry at, to become something he wasn't, to become somebody. We'll be right back. You should never see daylight again. I'm here today to call on the New York State Parole Board to deny the release of Mark Chapman. I know that my father would have been uh, really thrilled to be accepted in this way, officially. I had so much enjoyment being with Joan. I am so lucky. I feel very, very lucky. <laughs> and uh, yes, the most complaint I have is that he's not here. But he's somewhere in the sky, you know, I think. in that first year of being apart from Mark, I thought maybe divorce was the right thing to do. The only trouble was I loved Mark, and I really believed that he would kill himself if I left him. Even though sometimes in his pain and suffering from mental illnesses, he wrote me very hurtful, hate-filled letters, I knew in my heart that he loved me too. So I kept asking God what to do stay with Mark or leave, stay with Mark or leave. And I searched the Bible to read what God says about divorce. And finally, in the book of Malachi, I read these words. 
I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. That settled it. I closed the book, the Bible. From that moment on, from that point on, it didn't matter how long Mark was in prison, I would wait for him. Let me just bring you up to the present. Are you looking for truth from God's word that you can understand and apply to your life? How do you reach out and still provide um, what we might say that encouragement that godly wives would want to give to their husbands? Because you know he, he's accepted his life in prison, but it's still not in any form the kind of life that we would want to have. So tell us about that. Mark has the gift of evangelism, and he has the goal of reaching every man at that prison where he's at, Wendy Correctional, with the gospel. I'm on the outside, so I provide materials that he can give to inmates there. Mark has three brochures that he has written, or we've actually worked on them together. Even five minutes with Mark, that conversation is going to turn right around to Jesus. He loves to talk about Jesus. How do you know it isn't a crutch? Well, in a way, it's got to be a crutch because we all need a crutch. Life is not easy, and life for me isn't easy. And therefore, I think the Lord is has a tender spot in his heart for prisoners, and I've leaned on him. I, if it's a crutch, I've been leaning on a crutch, but it's a, it's, a, it's a crutch made out of the cross, because without that, I probably wouldn't be alive today. Today, I'm different. I read the Bible, I pray, and I, and I walk with him. He forgives me. He doesn't condone what I did. He didn't like all the pain I caused everybody, especially John's widow. But he forgives me, and he hears me, and he listens to me. And he is the one, all these years, that has brought me out of the abyss.